Well, once again, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. We have the, the pleasure of hearing from Sister Sarah Kimball this evening, who is a member of both the Oakland First Ward and of the Oakland Ber Ber Berkeley YSA Ward, uh, where she is, a, um, she is serving with her husband. And, uh, and Sarah comes, uh, she, Sarah has four children, three of whom are in college, and one of them who um, happily has turned 16 today. So congratulations to, um, to her son. Um, when asking, asked Sarah what her favorite calling was, she said her favorite calling is being a Relief Society teacher. And so that, um, that, that fits in very nicely here with what we're doing here this evening. Um, with regard to her hobbies and, and the things she likes to do, she likes to work out and hike and read. Um, and so um, we look forward to hearing Sarah from you this evening. I am um, very uh, excited to hear what you have to say, and I'll turn it over to you. All right. Come on. All right. Well, thank you so much. Good evening. I'm happy to see all of you, even if it's just over Zoom. I'm really starting to miss people. So it's nice to have this opportunity to be here. Um, I'd like to thank President Reigns for giving me this opportunity. Um, having three months to prepare for a lecture is both a blessing and a curse. Um, so I'm grateful to all my workout companions and family who have helped me flesh out the ideas that I have had while reflecting on the first vision, the restoration, and what it all means to me. And I promise starting next week, we can talk about something else. So uh, let's get started. I've titled my talk, the spiritual practice of remembering, how remembering the stories of the restoration increases our spiritual resiliency. Like many of you, we spend some time each summer with family. Um, I grew up in a small town in Idaho with my eight siblings. It looks like several of them are on tonight, so thank you guys. Um, and most of us try to make the trek back to Idaho with our families each year. We water ski and play games and eat an amazing amount of food but mostly we just like to be together. This year was a little bit different because of COVID. Um, our hometown 4th of July parade was canceled. And so we had our own 4th of July parade. So if you look over here to the back, um, this is a replica of the Diamond L Ranch, um, the barn, this is my great grandfather's home. And every time I see this barn, I feel a little bit of nostalgia for my hometown and the memories that I have there. Another part of this year's family reunion was sharing a bit of genealogy. Um, when, my, when we were growing up, my father told us stories about his ancestors all the time. And a few of my siblings have really devoted a lot of time to our genealogy as well. I, however, am a bit more of the, it's not my season yet for genealogy. Um, but my brother thought this would be a great opportunity for each of us to learn a little about my great, great grandfather, Ulrich, his wife, Elizabeth, and their children. My sister-in-law said, you don't really understand how to do genealogy until you do it. And so even though genealogy isn't really my thing, I was encouraged to do it anyway. Thus armed with the task to research my great grandfather, Diamond, there he is, um, who is Ulrich's son, I ventured on the family search and learned a few things that I never knew, even after all the stories my father had told. I learned that Diamond was not only an Idaho State Senator and representative, which I knew, I also know, or I also found out that he was the ward choir director and a great Sunday school teacher. I learned that he went to school to be a school teacher and learned quickly that he did not have the patience for it. I learned that he bought a beautiful piano for my aunt Lyle, who by the way was my first music teacher, and he himself would count out the beat for her to practice. When she was tired, he would have her take a rest, but then they'd get back to it. It's a beautiful father-daughter story that I didn't know about. And now I realize that Diamond cared about many of the same things that I care about, including teaching and music. When I felt that connection to him, suddenly this family history thing became a little more interesting to me. So on a Sunday morning, we sat outside in this beautiful grove of trees by my mom's home. We partook of the sacrament, we sang hymns, and we listened to the stories of our great, great grandparents and their 12 children. And then as a surprise to many of us, my sweet youngest nephew, um, gave a brief history of my own father, who passed away just a few months after he was born. Um, he didn't know him, obviously, so he researched things about my father, and sharing this loving tribute was a beautiful moment for all of us to remember. In fact, the task of researching can turn into a spiritual event in a beautiful, peaceful set uh, setting surrounded by the people I love. So what made this moment spiritual and impactful for me? 
certainly being with family and participating in gospel ordinances in a unique way was impactful. Being in nature, surrounded by God's beautiful earth, certainly enhanced the experience. But I think what made this moment spiritual for me was the remembrance of my ancestors. Earlier this year, as we were studying Alma 5 in the Come Follow Me lessons, I remember Alma repeating a phrase three times in verse 6. He says, And now, behold, I say unto you, my brethren, you that belong to this church, have you sufficiently retained in remembrance the captivity of your fathers? Yea, and have you sufficiently retained in remembrance his mercy and long suffering towards them? And moreover, have you sufficiently retained in remembrance that he has delivered their souls from hell? This is certainly not the only time a prophet or God has asked, have you remembered this? But Alma asked, have we remembered enough? And what is sufficient for us to remember our holy stories? Why does God need us to remember? In the standard works, the word remember is used 352 times. And when its variants are counted, that number jumps to more than 550. The root of remember is to keep in mind or to be mindful. And it also has links to the word tradition. We pay attention when the Lord says something over and over again. So we know that 550 times means to remember is important. But is remembering just a matter of recall of people, places, and events, or is it something more? When President Reigns first asked me to talk about the first vision, I thought much like I did when I was asked to research my great-grandfather. What makes remembering this so important to me? Obviously, my great-grandfather Diamond is important because without him, I wouldn't be here. And obviously, the first vision is important to me because without it, I wouldn't be here either. But in spending more time studying and remembering my grandparents, I feel a greater connection to them. And by studying the first vision, I've gained a greater connection to it also. These stories are about people who lived in a different time and place than me, yet they're still part of the foundation of who I am. In her, spiritual, in her book, The Spiritual Practice of Remembering, Margaret Bendroff suggests that remembering, like all matters spiritual, requires imagination, trust, and courage. We're all part of a much larger story that began long ago. As she says, the past, oh, let's go back. The past tense is essential to our language of faith. Without it, our conversation is limited and thin and growing thinner all the time. So I determined that instead of just recalling what happened in 1820, I try to remember it, as Ben Ross suggests, using my imagination. And for my purposes, that means forming new ideas or images or concepts to help me remember it better, the first vision. I think both Andy's and Eric's presentations were great examples of how we use our imaginations to connect with the first vision. Andy through personal insights and connections, and Eric through using the arts to help us explain the ineffable. For me, I like to dig into the past and ask the who, what, when, where, why, and how of history. It helps me get a more complete picture and to help make the connections to my life. So I'm gonna share with you three takeaways I've had from the first vision and using my imagination, I'll try and see how they become part of my story. The first one, Joseph was a seeker. Joseph did read James 1, 1, 5 and it did prompt him to pray. But even before that, Joseph was affected by the religious frenzy in the area. I love this picture of Joseph because he looks more like a 14 year old than in many other depictions that we have at this moment. Knowing myself as a 14-year-old and having read four children, one who turned 16 today, I quite admire that Joseph was using his time contemplating his eternal salvation instead of video games, social events, or sports. But I needed to look a little more at his history to see what could be driving his contemplative nature. If you've read the beginning of Saints or Revelations in Context, you probably know of the great volcanic eruption in 1815 in Indonesia that led to unpredictable weather patterns, crop destruction, and disease throughout the world, including in New, New England. The spring of 1816 in Vermont quickly turned back to winter and was known as the year without a summer. This affected so many New England families and the Smiths were no exception. They determined that they should gather their things and move to Western New York. Land was less expensive there and the Erie Canal was in the process of being built, which would increase the economic opportunities for the region. It's actually estimated that 10% of, of the United States population moved to greater New York during this period. With this migration also came a religious awakening. Until this time, most clergy were elite men trained in college. These clergy were Congregationalists or descendants of the Puritan churches. By the 1800s, however, clergy became a career choice by many men, most of whom did not have a religious degree or a distinguished pedigree. 
Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian preachers and began to hold religious services and revivals all over the country, including in Western New York. Religion had become more of a choice. By the time Joseph was 12, he began to be concerned with his own salvation. He actually wasn't much of a reader, but he did attend these rallies and revivals, and he witnessed many people at these revivals having really overt religious experiences. He wanted this himself, but he didn't feel anything. As I was reading Lucy Max Smith's history, which you can find in the Joseph Smith papers, I found that much like Joseph, Lucy felt discouraged by the jockeying of different religious sects. She said, if I remain as I am, a member of no church, all religious people will say I'm of the world. And if I join someone of a different denomination, all the rest will say I'm in error. No church will admit that I'm right, except the one with which I'm associated. And this makes them witnesses against each other. And how can I decide in such a case as this? seeing that they're all unlike the Church of Christ as it existed in former days. At one point, Lucy suffers from a serious bout of consumption and covenants with the Lord that if he heals her, she will seek to do his will. Her body did heal, but her spirit was agitated as she wanted to keep her covenant to God. She sought preachers from many uh, different religions, but all was left feeling disappointed. This is one of my favorite quotes. As she said of one, I returned home well convinced that he neither understood nor appreciated the subject upon which he spoke. Finally, as her oldest son turned 22, she found a preacher who would baptize her but wouldn't compel her to join any religious denomination. I think Lucy's story helps explain Joseph's predisposition to speaking, to seeking, sorry, but it also teaches us a great lesson on how long our spiritual journeys take. Lucy's faith journey lasted 20 plus years. For all of us, some principles of our faith come easily, where others take time, experience, and trial before they become part of us. Seeking is not a momentary task, but a lifetime adventure. As a side note here, I love that after he has the first vision, Lucy is the first person that Joseph sees. I'm sure that his mother was a great example to Joseph of seeking. Joseph was a seeker, Lucy was a seeker, and as Latter-day Saints, we're taught that we also need to be seeking after the truth. Being seeker, being a seeker is part of my story. My next takeaway, Joseph Smith asks a lot of questions. When Mary Ann Cropper and I began teaching the Doctrine and Covenants to our seminary students a couple of years ago, I'll admit I was not really started to, uh, excited to start. The Doctrine and Covenants had not been my favorite year of seminary as a student. What I didn't know was how lucky I was going to be to teach the Doctrine and Covenants right after the first volume of Saints had come out shortly after Revelations in Context had come out, and definitely after the Joseph Smith papers and other historically accurate documents had been published to help me understand the meaning behind the sections. It's a hallelujah moment. Uh, so for those of you who don't know where to access this great material, um, I'm gonna show you here. If you go into Gospel Library, and you look up to the right corner, there's an, a section called the Restoration and Church History. And then if you go into that, it shows you all of this treasure trove of documents from the saints volumes to revelations in context to church um, history topics. Um, and if you can see where it says first vision, that is where the Joseph Smith papers are. So back to seminary. We had a bulletin board in the front of the room with the words, it all started with a question surrounding it. In the Pearl of Great Price, the question Joseph asks of God is which of the sex was right. But the reason he wanted to know the answer to that question was because he was concerned about the state of his soul. He wanted to know if he could be forgiven for his sins, and if so, what church could bring him those answers. Joseph actually had heard about James 1.5 in one of the many religious revivals that he was attending. It really stood out to him because previous to this time, the idea of sola scriptura, or by scripture alone, was the prevalent doctrine. It meant that the Bible was a sole infallible source of authority for Christian faith and practice. In other words, all answers could only be found in scripture. When Joseph heard that he could ask God for answers, both confused and excited him. As he says, never did any passage of scripture come with more power to the heart of a man than did at this time to than, than this did at this time to mine. After much contemplation, Joseph heeds James's counsel and heads to the woods to pray. Almost every section in the Doctrine and Covenants is a response to a question. Joseph asked the Lord so many questions, both for himself and for others. He never stopped seeking for answers including questions about passages of scriptures he was reading. He asked in behalf of others what would be God's will for them. 
and often he asked questions to try and understand how he was to restore the gospel to the earth and create the Lord's church. Can you imagine trying to restore the gospel and not asking questions? Questions show humility, curiosity, and even charity. Sherry Dew said, the Lord wants us to ask every probing question we can muster because not asking questions can be far more dangerous than asking them. I have had and will continue to have questions about the gospel and about my life. Some questions are answered as I read the scriptures, study, and discuss them with, with friends, but many can only be answered by prayer. And as Andy said in his lecture, no one has a greater right to personal revelation than anyone else. And as we learned from a young inquiring mind in 1820, when we ask, God listens. Joseph asked a lot of questions, and so should we. My third point. Joseph saw God the Father and his son Jesus Christ. One of the most astounding aspects of the first vision for me is that Joseph Smith's prayer was answered in real time by our Heavenly Father and by his son. As Richard Bushman pointed out in a recent address, Joseph doesn't even call them the father and son. Rather, he describes the pillar of light and then two personages standing in the air whose brightness and glory defy all description. How do you describe a light that is brighter than any light you've ever seen? What kind of light resides in the divine? And how do you describe the divine within the constraints of mortal language? When Joseph first attempts to pray in the grove, he recalls, I immediately was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me and had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. He summons courage to pray again, and suddenly that darkness fades and that pillar of light descended. In eight, his 1832 account of the first vision, Joseph describes how he felt after he had seen the father and the son. My soul was filled with love, and for many days I could rejoice with great joy. The contrast between the feelings of darkness and light, between dark forces and divine forces are so clear here. It reminds me of the times that I have turned to the Lord in the midst of dark moments, in moments I was hurting or ashamed, in moments I was distraught and afraid. After such prayers, I was lighter. My hope had been restored by a loving Father. How blessed are we to know the true nature of God. Joseph Smith's revelations about the nature of God, man, and our eternal divinity are some of the most important and innovative theological contributions of the modern age. As Patrick Mason wrote in his book, Planted, Belief and Belonging in an Age of Doubt, the singularly brilliant insight of Mormon theology is that God and humans are of the same species and that humans are co-eternal with God. We are not mere creatures. We are eternal spirits, children of God, goddesses and gods in development. As far as theology goes, how cool is that? Our understanding of God the Father and of Jesus Christ is shaped by this experience of Joseph in the grove. So seeking, asking questions, and understanding the nature of God really stood out to me while I was studying the first vision. But there are all kinds of takeaways we can find when we use our imagination to, to connect with the first vision or any aspect of the restoration. I think knowing and understanding our church history thus provide a depth and a strength to our own spiritual story. And I think that is why the Lord pleads with us to remember. I like to think of it as adding weight to our buckets of faith, weight that keeps us steady when trials arise. But what happens when remembering doesn't bring us joy? In this section, I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on the second part of Ben Dross' quote, because when remembering that our past doesn't bring us joy, we need to rely on trust and courage to move forward. I'm going to jump back to the beginning of my talk for a moment here. There we go. This is my great-great-grandfather, Orwick, and his wife, Elizabeth, the one we researched this summer. I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about him. He grew up in the German-speaking part of Switzerland. He joined the church in 1857 with his wife and immigrated to the United States in 1860. He crossed the plains in John D. Ross's company and was the captain of the Swiss Saints. In 1868, he returned to Switzerland to settle his father's estate. And while there, he served a mission under President Carl G. Mazur. And there he met Elizabeth Eggman, a woman with two children and pregnant with another who had been abandoned by her husband. She returned to the U.S. with Ulrich and they were married in the Salt Lake Endowment House. Unfortunately, Ulrich was already married with children at home. When he returned with Elizabeth at his side, his first wife chased him out of town with a broom. This was a story my father told us often. And it may be a troubling story, but I'm very grateful he did marry Elizabeth 
because I'm one of her descendants. Ulrich worked on the Salt Lake City Temple, built roads, made caskets, and homesteaded multiple properties, including land near my hometown. Also, Ulrich had a temper. He was known to get into fights with his neighbors. He once beat his son Lundy so hard that he left town. The sheriff found Lundy, but when he saw the severity of his beating, he helped him find work in Yellowstone far away. Another son, Andrew, also ran away from home and he never returned, nor did they hear any more about him. Another famous story is that toward the end of his life, great-great-grandfather was hard of hearing, so his son had a rocking chair placed at the front of the chapel so that he could hear the service. Unfortunately, he sometimes used that as a right to berate whoever was speaking, and he was known to have been dragged from the chapel by the bishop and the sheriff during this rant. So what do we do when we learn something about our history that doesn't sit well with us? Could my great-great-grandfather still be a good person, even if he'd done some very bad things? And how do we process this kind of information? As Scott Fitzgerald once wrote, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. I thought about this quote many times when I've encountered the complexity of humans, history, and ideas that seemingly are at opposite ends of the spectrum, yet both are true. My great-great-grandfather was a good man and a good leader my great-great-grandfather beat his children and got into fights with neighbors. What do we do when we encounter this concept of two opposed ideas being true when we talk about our church history? I bring this up because I know that the first vision is troubling to some members of the church. My husband and I were talking about this the other day. It seems that at most baptisms that we attended as children, the first vision movie was played while the newly baptized member got dressed. The movie was based on the story that has been canonized in The Pearl of Great Price, and for most members, the only story they know. However, there are many stories, and people found out that Joseph shared a number of different versions of the first vision, and that several other accounts were written by others, all similar, but definitely all had differences, and it threw some for a loop. Even in Joseph's time, sharing his experience brought much criticism and mocking. He said, I don't blame anyone for not believing my history. If I had not experienced what I have, I would not have believed it myself. I think our church, like any institution that cares about its image, has been selective in presenting its history. It has at times sacrificed the whole story in order to highlight the edited, determined the best stories. So when people find out about the details they hadn't previously learned, it feels like they've been lied to. Patrick Mason says, caught off guard, they are unsure what to make of information that conflicts with what they already believe. And every person's set of troubling questions is different but many of the same difficult historical and doctrinal topics come up over and over again, like polygamy, um, the race-based priesthood temple restriction before 1978, women in the priesthood, the church's relationship to modern science, the translation of the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon, the treatment of LGBTQ members, and the existence of multiple accounts of Joseph Smith's vision. I was listening to Melissa Inoue discuss her book on the Maxwell Institute podcast the other day, and I'm I'm just going to share the full title. Crossings, a bald Asian American Latter-day Saint women scholars ventures through life, death, cancer, and motherhood, not necessarily in that order. Very long title, very interesting book. She was talking about what happens when we come across some of these conflicting ideas in our church history. This is one of her sections. Faith isn't a string of Christmas lights. You know, when you're setting up the tree and the Christmas music's playing and something, a cinnamon like is wafting from the kitchen and you plug the lights in and nothing. One bulb is out and now the whole thing just doesn't work. Inoue notes that sometimes people of our faith find out things about our church history that seem very ugly to them. That makes them very uncomfortable and it kind of ruins their whole faith chain. For instance, someone finds out that Joseph wasn't completely forthright with his wife about polygamy. Well then he wasn't a prophet, therefore the Book of Mormon's fake, therefore the whole church must be bogus. One broken thing leads to everything being broken. It can work negatively another way as well. The Book of Mormon is true, therefore the church is true, therefore we cannot possibly make any mistakes. Both of these versions of explaining the value of our religious project are flawed, because if you knock out any one of those junctures, the whole thing blows up. And in our church, we do make mistakes, because we are human. Instead of a string of Christmas lights, Inuway prefers the metaphor of faith being like a loaf of sourdough bread. Like many of you during quarantine, I have joined the sourdough bandwagon. Your process starts simply with a little flour and water, 
which you feed and let grow and ferment and throw much of it away until it changes enough to become an amazing starter. This culture of bacteria that you introduce back into the flower unlocks the potential of those starch molecules and it creates really awesome bread. The point is this process is complex and messy, but wholly awesome and alive. Inoue says, when we think about our church and our religious tradition, not as a mechanical thing, but as a living organism, then those kinds of contradictions, different strains of being who we are, make a little more sense. In essence, as we mature in life and in the gospel, we need to understand that complexities and ambiguities do exist. The Apostle Paul wrote, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So although the Lord wants us to become teachable, humble, and loving like little children, he wants us to treat the gospel with the wisdom of an adult. Elder Bruce C. Hafen gave an excellent BYU devotional entitled On Dealing with Uncertainty several years ago. In it, he points out that as we get older, we add a new dimension to our perspective, a growing awareness that there's a kind of gap between the real and ideal, between what is and what ought to be. He further explains, bumping into conflicts anywhere in our lives, but especially in the gospel, can make us want to dodge the ambiguity so we don't have to deal with the tension that it creates. The Lord has a way of helping us resolve our ambiguities in ways that both stretch and strengthen us. If we can resolve ambiguities with a believing attitude, our faithful choices will lead ultimately to our sanctification. The Lord wants us to remember our past. He wants us to remember our ancestors and our church forebearers, but I don't think he wants us to remember them as perfect persons. They aren't, and more importantly, in their human struggles and frailties, we may learn our greatest lessons. And this is what I mean by remembering our past with trust and courage. Trust that we can face whatever we find in our history, especially when combined with faith, and courage to seek after what we don't understand. We need to put the same care in learning about things that we don't understand as we do with the things we cherish. And if we do it with faith, I believe that this will also strengthen our spiritual foundation. I'll give you an example. In my last semester at BYU, I took a class on 19th century Mormon women. This class was more of a seminar with just a few students. As part of our studies, we transcribed women's journals from the time when polygamy was an accepted practice. You would think that studying polygamy would cause me to turn away from the church as I had to confront all the contradictory ideas that plural marriage posed to my understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But actually, what I transcribed were accounts of very strong women who could depend on themselves when their husbands were home or away, women who could get along with sister wives, women who reared children in righteousness and handled homesteading and businesses, women who joined the suffragette movement, women who loved and were loved. Beautiful, complicated, multidimensional women. Our teacher never wanted to justify polygamy, but she did let us know that the why behind it was on her shelf of questions that she wanted answered when she got to the other side. So even though polygamy is one of my troublesome questions, by remembering the women's stories, I have examples of great faith and perseverance that build up my foundation. It also gives me hope that just as polygamy ended, so will other practices that don't resonate with my understanding of my loving heavenly parents. Finally, remembering the stories that bind us. Through this talk, I've woven stories from my ancestral past, as well as stories from the first vision, the restoration, and other things into my story. Remembering these stories has helped build my bucket of faith, even when I find some of them troubling. And all of these stories are limited by memory, internal and external sensors, and simple human imperfections, yet they're part of my greater story. A study on successful families was conducted in the early 2000s by Emory University. They asked children 20 different questions about their family. Things like, do you know where your mom and dad went to high school? Do you know where your parents met? Do you know an illness or something really terrible that happened in your family? The surprising results of those questions compared with the children's results to a battery of um, psychological tests show that the more children knew about their family's history, the stronger their sense of control over their lives, the higher their self-esteem, and the more successfully they believe their families functioned. Two months later, something horrible happened, September 11th. The professors took the opportunity to reassess the same children again after this tragedy, and they found that those who knew more about their families proved to be more resilient, meaning they could moderate the effects of stress better than their peers. 
why does this work? The professors felt that knowing you're a part of a larger family is unifying. And those who had heard family stories of ups and downs, triumphs and setbacks, had the most confidence of all. So understanding history has become a factor in unifying and overcoming hard times. I believe that our ancestral stories and stories of our church history have the ability to, uni to unify us and help us be more spiritually resistant. And I believe that spending more time seeking, studying, and asking questions will only make us more resilient and open to the spirit. Elder Uchtdorf once said, brothers and sisters, as good as our previous experience may be, if we stop asking questions, stop thinking, stop pondering, we can thwart the revelations of the spirit. Remember, it is the questions young Joseph asked that opened the door for the restoration of all things. We can block the growth and knowledge of our Heavenly Father intends for us. How often has the Holy Spirit tried to tell us something we needed to know, but couldn't get past the massive iron gate of what we thought we already knew? I'll close with this lovely testimony of Louis Mitchley, a professor emeritus of political science at BYU. We have, I believe, a network of stories reaching back before this world to a plan of redemption in which the Messiah, God himself, took on flesh in an effort to redeem otherwise lost and fallen beings like me. If this is true, then we have genuinely good news and hence also something to hold on to and to follow. From the very moment I began to know anything about these matters, I wanted the network of stories to be true. Brothers and sisters, I want these networks of stories to be true also. They may be messy and complicated, but they are ours and we need to remember them. I pray that like Joseph, we continue to seek after the truth. We continue to ask all the questions and we, we believe that God our Father and our brother Jesus Christ are listening to every one of them. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.